friends, I'm very happy to uh, welcome Dr. Kumar Swami, who hardly needs any introduction in K Circle anywhere. But as is our customary, I'll just say a few words briefly about him. Uh, Dr. Kumar Swami uh, has a PhD in physics from IIT Madras. And after working for a few years in a research laboratory in North India, he joined Rishi Valley as a teacher of physics and uh, has been there as a part of KFI for close to 40 decades, four decades now, and uh, has also been a part of the administration. Uh, Dr. Kumar Swami is a very senior trustee of the foundation for more than three decades. And it's a pleasure to have him. I'm very happy that he accepted the invitation of this group to talk to us. And the theme of his talk is, what does learning mean in the context of daily living? So the format is that uh, you may uh, speak for about any, anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, after that, uh, Dr. Gajanan Rao and uh, Sri Harsh Thankha both may make some observations for 10, 15 minutes each. And then there will be questions from the audience. With these words, may I uh, request Dr. Kumar Swami to please go ahead and uh, deliver your talk. Dr. Kumar Swami. Thank you, Dubeji, uh, for uh, extending invitation and also the participants to uh, meet all of you in this uh, virtual space. Okay. And um, share my thoughts. Okay. I hope I would do justice for um, inviting me into this uh, distinguished uh, forum. I'd been hearing about this very active forum for a number of years. People meeting regularly and sharing their thoughts. So uh, this question that I have raised been occurring, you know, off and on. Uh, it has been uh, coming up in my mind and sometimes very seriously, sometimes I, you know, it takes a back seat, but it's something that I had been internally exploring for myself. What does it mean to learn? You see, it became uh, much more forcefully uh, to the front a few days ago when I was listening to uh, one of the Krishnaji's uh, Krishna, uh, question answer uh, sessions, a video, and I suddenly realized that I could predict what Krishna was about to say. Okay. And I, I then began to wonder whether I had become too familiar okay, with his words, with his way of thinking, okay, with that whole terminology that people deploy okay, in their conversations. See, I had attended many gatherings and so on, attended many discussions. And you can make out it is a key discussion because there is a certain flow to it, a particular a style of uh, sharing their thoughts, the vocabulary, you know, etc. Probably if you go to a congregation of Vedantic people, you will find a similar, their own terminology, etc. So I, I just wondered whether I am becoming a scholar, okay, an expert on Krishnamurti, where people ask me to speak and I am able to read. Read out. Normally, I suggest to people that, you know, they could just, there are so many videos are available and they could engage in first with the Krishnaji's teachings and if they have serious questions, then we could discuss. Okay. Now, the, the one of the questions that has been, uh, as I was telling you, that uh, that has been uppermost on my mind is that um, we have heard Krishnaji for a number of years. Okay, and whether we remain more or less the same. Okay, that is a question that I'm not implying anything that people remain the same or not the same, but it is a temperaments remain as they are. That is, if some event occurs, how a particular person responds to it is quite unique in some sense. Okay, some people react very quickly. Uh, some people take a little more time. Some people are too suspicious. They try to read behind what that person uh, stated. And this happens even if the person or persons have been 
listening to Krishna Ji for a number of years. I'm not excluding myself from this list. Please don't misunderstand me that I'm not sitting on judgment of anyone. But a general uh, phenomenon that I think most of you have observed or somewhat familiar with. Okay. So the question is, uh, what is learning? Okay. We are all familiar with the learning in the domain or uh, acquiring factual knowledge. Krishna Ji also, you know, uh, shared his thoughts on this one. Okay. And uh, Krishna Ji often says that, you know, that uh, you read something or listen to something, then memorize it, repeat, repeat, and so on. It's a mechanical process. Though it does rather a, a starkly put, and I don't completely share that with that view of academic learning because I see that some serious people have do have insights. Some of them are of great depth, especially I am familiar with the scientific domain. And uh, they have really been able to uh, come make a leap, a quantum jump in their thinking, which nobody had earlier come up with. And then new knowledge is built around that one. But we must concede here that this process of uh, having this great insight, whatever is that insight, and if it has any relevance to the daily living, uh, I have a doubt. Because if you look at many of those people, they seem to be just like anybody else in their uh, daily life, in the way they relate to people. They have their own ambitions. They quarrel. You see, many of the great scientists have had bitter disputes between themselves and so on. So there is something probably is missing in the kind of a learning that brings about in the academic or factual knowledge acquisition process. Okay. So then what is missing in this domain that is in the domain of daily living? That's the question that I would like to explore. Now, to understand this one, I feel that we need to um, first understand the way our mind or brain works in our day-to-day -day interactions. Okay. And this has a certain, uh, you know, the background, the background due to biology, due to evolution and so on, that I would like to briefly touch upon as I go along. Okay. Now, the, let me take an example. Okay. Uh, suppose somebody comes and tells me something rather harsh. That, that is the words which are rather unpleasant and so on, okay? That is something of a factual kind. That is those words I register, okay? It's a fairly physical process of registration. And I don't know whether the conscious mind has any control over it in the acquisition because we seem to listen to sounds even in sleep, okay? It has been proved time and again. That's the reason why we don't close our ears when we are sleeping. Okay, whereas we close the eyes and it has a certain biological function of survival and so on. So uh, we uh, hear physically the certain words, okay, we process to an extent and then something else begins from there. That is the comparison with what we have in image about ourselves and then following that from certain emotions arise within us. And then a conclusion about the other person who had uttered those words. Okay. So the next time that we meet this person, um, that image that we have created about other person comes in almost instantaneously when we meet. And so the next time and the next time when we interact, okay, the attention that we pay to that person diminishes. And this is this comes from a habit of the brain, uh, which has a certain um, survival advantages. Okay, because to pay attention to what somebody is saying or to pay attention to uh, something that we see around, it require it consumes some energy. That attention requires some energy, and if you have to give the same amount of energy every time we see a person or a flower or something else, okay? It need, we need to gather that kind of energy, which probably is not easily available to all of us, okay? It is probably scattered. 
Now, what therefore happens is that when we see something for the first time, we pay a lot of attention. For example, when we go to a new place, okay, we are quite alert. We are observing what is around, okay, and how to find our way. We are uh, looking at things that are uh, that are new, that is attractive, and so on. Okay, and similarly, when we see some flower for the first time, our face lights up. And this has been proved by experimentally also that certain brain regions light up uh, when we see something for the first time. But what happens is when we uh, see it a second time, third time, okay, uh, the brain is less active because it already had extracted certain features and it just compares and finds the same old thing and then doesn't pay that much attention. Okay, so therefore, in that way, it is able to conserve the energy. Next time, next time, and so on, it has to spend less and less amount of energy, and that energy, the brain can deploy for other functions. Okay, so uh, this is a process of conserving the energy. However, if you look at uh, small children that is under three years old, you find that children repeatedly enjoy the same thing. A two-year-old, you show something, and you show it again after 10 minutes, okay, or 15 minutes, they are still delighted to see it. Apparently, they don't have the yet the long-term memory formation. So they're able to see it again for the as if it is the first time they are seeing it. I have tried it also with uh, some children, very young children, and this is true. Okay. Now, is there, well, because that when we see something which has already been seen, we don't pay much attention. We are able to deploy our energy on other things simultaneously. To give you an example, uh, when you are walking along the familiar uh, path, okay, we don't notice what is around. Okay? We just reach from, say, office to home or home to office, okay? and we are talking or thinking about something ahead or uh, of the past or what we have to do when we go to our office and so on. And we hardly notice what is around, except when we meet somebody and so on, okay? There is an evolutionary, there is a, apparently there are two pathways in the brain, okay? One pathway, uh, the same, along both the pathways, the same information flows by splitting and along one pathway, the information goes to those regions which control our uh, motor actions. That is, we are able to move uh, even being absent-minded. Okay. It is because of that pathway that exists. And the second pathway is used for, you know, thinking about things, okay, planning, execution, planning, execution, and so on. And that's the reason why there is a a certain absent-mindedness in the whole thing. Okay. Whereas somebody like Krishnaji seems to seem to have, okay, uh, Krishnaji seem to have um, uh, that acute observation when he is going along the path. We have noticed, for example, in Rishi Valley, even though he came after one year, he knew if a particular tree was missing on the roadside. Okay. He would ask, okay, what has happened to that tree, sir? I know the person who was in charge, Mr. Naidu, used to be a bit nervous before Krishnaji came because the tree had died for some reason. And Krishnaji would ask for all the details, how it has died and so on. Okay. So he had a very good memory. Okay. We can also infer this one from, uh, you know, uh, his uh, writings in, say, the commentaries on living, okay, the books of that kind. There is a vivid description of nature. Uh, conversations also, who said what, and so on. It's quite vivid. So I, the memory itself is not a problem for, for people like uh, him, okay? It's somehow the memory becomes a problem for us, okay? I would like to explore that point a little further down, okay? Now, the point that I want to emphasize here is that we are um, not integrated, okay? We are uh, kind of let's say we are doing multitasking. Okay. Unfortunately, this has become uh, even more acute now with all the social media and so on. There is always constant flow of information. 
not just an information around nature and so on, but is information from other people who are very far away and so on. So we are completely, we seem to be, okay, increasingly becoming distracted with a variety of things. And that, therefore, there's a lack of integration. The mind is, the brain is not looking at anything with its full attention. That is gathering all its energy. Okay. Now, to be able to, uh, uh, you know, to observe something, okay, as fleeting as the um, resisting of uh, uh, the hurt and the consequent arousal of emotions and so on, it requires a brain which has all this energy and also needs to be, it needs to slow down. We are constantly busy with the finishing. Okay, I, I notice that people keep scrolling their uh, WhatsApp messages or attending to something or the other. Okay, even while talking, for example, there are many young people who uh, are uh, looking through the phone, looking at the phone when they are eating. Okay, and the older people looking at the TV when they are eating. Okay. And even while walking also now people have music and so on that as they are going around, okay, walking has become simply as a matter of exercise, okay. So this, this addiction to multitasking, okay, this inability to get out of this multitasking, at least we don't realize that what kind of fragmentation is, is creating, is, it prevents us from, okay, looking at anything with that total attention that Krishnaji has uh, demanded, okay, to be able to understand human relationships and so on. Now, uh, how do we go about it? How do we examine this process, okay, understand it, okay, and move ahead? Okay. So what I feel is that this attention, uh, this gathering of energy, uh, this prevention of fragmentation, requires on our part uh, a certain diligence, okay, a certain commitment, okay, not forcing ourselves and so on, but a certain feeling that this is important in my life, this, I must do it, okay, um, that kind of a demand that is placed without causing pressure, because pressure, uh, arise, pressure is there if you say by tomorrow I have to do it or by next moment I have to do it and so on. But if I don't put that kind of a time uh, limit, but if I simply say that, why is it that I'm not uh, paying attention to this? Let me just see what is it that is holding me down, okay? Uh, examining it uh, carefully my daily life, okay? And that decluttering is very important. And that we have to do it, it's, I call it a preparation. I, I don't call it as a kind of a ritual. It's not a ritual that you do every morning or evening and so on for one hour, okay, or uh, wait for some time. Like some years ago, one gentleman told me who had attended, who used to come here for gathering. He said, look, I have uh, one more daughter who needs to be married off. Once she's uh, married off, then I can pay more attention to Krishna's teachings, okay? It is not something that you can wait, you will have to see the urgency of it now and bringing in whatever energy that I can muster, okay, in my, uh, the, and be diligent about it, okay, it may not happen now, okay, but there is that persistence, there is that questioning myself and sincerity, I think it, it will come, that's my feeling, okay, it is possible, you don't have to demonstrate to anyone, but in my own life, I can demonstrate it to myself, okay. Now, this reducing the clutter preparation, I'll see it is just like a clearing one's desk, okay. If you want to write something serious and so on, you want to you prepare yourself mentally, okay, so that your mind is freer to get those thoughts that you want to gather on paper and uh, also make sure that you have all things in place before you start writing. It is something of that kind and that is something that should be an ongoing thing. Okay, examining and uh, decluttering, I would call it. Now, there are certain things that we can do deliberately in 
this process. Okay, that is um, as Krishnaji uh, in his discussions with students, he often used to draw, particularly very young children uh, in Rishi Valley, for example. Yeah, lots of eighth standard, ninth standard students who would interact with him, sit with him, and uh, in the uh, dialogues with students, and uh, he invariably urges the children to watch those flowers, okay, that are there next to that, you know, close to the auditorium where he was giving the talk. Okay, you can see them. He will point out, you watch those flowers, okay, just see how the light is falling on them, okay, and see the colors and look at that tree, okay, and see how the shadows move, okay, and see how the tree is different at different times in the day, okay. I, I, I feel that Krishnaji was drawing our attention to these things to, um, you know, because it is easier for us to observe the external world, okay. We could begin there, you know, to to see things, to see things with certain deliberation, not forcing ourselves with, with saying that, yes, I need to look at this room, okay, where things are kept in this room, right? Not have a running commentary, criticize the person who is the occupant of that room, but simply taking it in, rather than just start off with a conversation with the person. I look around, find out, okay, with certain deliberation, okay? And in that process, Okay, I notice many things. Similarly, when I'm walking, I, I would like to, okay, say that, uh, remind myself, okay, to look at those flowers that sometimes we may just tank over. Okay, those little flowers, especially this season where the valley is full of flowers in Shiva Valley because of uh, better rains this year, continuous rains. And uh, there are a variety of small flowers. We normally take note of only the big ones but we don't look at uh, how beautiful those little ones are. It's a great symmetry, okay, various shades, okay. And maybe we should begin there if we have a difficulty in looking inward, okay, noticing things, okay. And also, uh, whatever tasks we are performing, you know, we are always uh, thinking in terms of, you know, finishing them, okay, finish this one, checklist. We have a checklist of things during the day I cut out one after the other, right? And I finished, I feel good about it that I finished all of them. But is it possible to do, uh, let's say sweeping the floor, okay? Uh, which is the task most people avoid, <laughs> leave it to the maids or somebody else. Is it possible to do the same thing with certain deliberation, observing it, okay? And not with the idea that I had to finish and go and wash clothes or whatever it is. Any, any activity that I'm performing, can I do it without this, that sense of uh, wanting to finish it? Okay. I, I believe that, uh, that wanting to finish quickly, okay, that has been the motto okay, of the entire science actually. All the gadgets that we are manufacture, it is to minimize the time. Okay. The thing that I do I used to do it in one hour, now I can do it in half an hour. If you see the many advertisements and so on, it's a convenience, you don't have to do it directly yourself. You can press buttons and you can finish it like this, okay? All of them are designed to kind of minimize the time that we spend. Then they say that you can do more things, okay? You can do more interesting things and so on. That's how they sell things. So the, my point is, is it possible to move away from that way of thinking? To do something, even if it is somewhat unpleasant or whatever it is, to do it with deliberation, okay? And that way we'll pay attention to it. If I'm sweeping, I see that I have swept even the corners, there's nothing is left, okay? There are cobwebs, I look at it carefully, okay? It, when I do that without the intention of finishing it, in shorter time, then I find my mind is slowing down. Okay. It is, that is, I feel, is the key to stay with it, with something. Okay. If you observe, even with the most beautiful things we cannot stay with, whether it is a flower or anything else, okay, our mind immediately moves away and starts thinking about, you know, what it was like yesterday, you know, if 
we are looking at sunrise or sunset, there's always a comparison that begins. So I, I'm suggesting that whether we, by doing these things with a certain deliberation, daily chores, we might be able to uh, make the, the brain or the mind to attend to it, to watch it, okay? Uh, watch it unfold, how it responds to things, whether it is trying to, you know, whether it is getting bored because you are sweeping or washing clothes and therefore trying to run away from it, finish and not notice, okay, the stains on the clothes and so on. I am giving very simple examples, okay, uh, because these are things that we often don't notice. That's why I'm deliberately uh, selecting. There are major things which we pay attention to because there are certain consequences to them. Whereas these things, nobody is going to give us a prize for doing some sweeping properly, okay, or tidying up a place and so on. So uh, my request is that whether we can do acts of this kind, for even folding clothes, for example, it can be extremely relaxing uh, thing, ironing clothes, for example, if you are not in a hurry, if you are not in a hurry to finish, okay, you, then you can observe the mind in operation, okay, uh, what it is doing, whether it is thinking about what kind of things the brain is, uh, you know, uh, tossing in its inside, okay. It, it is, there is a delight in it, I would like to say, from my own, uh, okay, uh, whatever I had seen, it is not something that, you know, it's a boring, it's not something of a torture, but there is a delight in seeing uh, the mind in operation, okay? It's astonishing, really, to, to put one's finger on it, okay? Uh, not that as an external entity, but it's observing itself, okay? in a all possible manner, right? how it is going and so on. So uh, I hope it is possible for all of us to engage uh, with ourselves, okay? And... Uh, and down? Slowing down is necessary because, okay, as you know, it's our common observation, if you're traveling very fast, okay, in a train, for example, what is just outside the window is very difficult to observe. You, even, you can even feel dizzy because of that, you know, it's so rapid to change. Whereas if you slow down, you are able to watch things unfold, okay? Those electric poles that pass by, you see each of them, you can read what is written on those poles and so on, okay? It's something similar. When we turn our gaze inward, the mind is prepared to, you know, slow down and look at things. Then we can see that those words that have been uttered, how they get resisted. There may be no control over that process. I don't think there is anybody has any control over the process of registration itself. It may be just a, a physical event. But what happens thereafter, I think is simply a more psychological one where the comparisons, the recall of the past and then arise, arousal of the certain emotions, hurt, and uh, uh, conclusions from that one about other people, okay. There is, uh, though this uh, thing happens so rapidly, but if the mind is slow, I think it can find that gap between the physical resistance of those words and the arousal of those uh, uh, emotional, uh, uh, new state of emotions. My submission is that if one can stay in that interval, if the brain pauses there, in that interval between registration and the arousal of emotions, if it stays there, the insight will arise. I think that it is inevitable, that's what I feel. It's an inevitable thing that there is a perception about what I need to do. Okay, action, I believe, emerges from that point where uh, that pausing okay, from the registration of these uh, words and arousal of those emotions, if there is an interval, time interval, it is too short. Okay. But if one is uh, slowed down and is able to stay there, then you find the, that you are not responding mechanically from your past. 
from your own earlier uh, insecurities or securities or whatever it is, you know, other uh, you know images and so on. But the response could be a, a, uh, something that is quite fresh. Okay, that response, uh, how that response would be, what it will do, I don't think it can is predictable right now. Okay, at that stage, it will find its own course of action, okay, which probably it could solve whatever it is, the, this one, or it may not solve the problem, whatever if there is a problem. But your one's own mental state is quite different from what generally happens in the next step, typically, that is feeling of hurt and, uh, you know, mulling over it repeatedly and so on. Okay. In this con context, I would like to uh, quote a, uh, you know, a conversation uh, Krishnaji had with one of the participants. Uh, this is in uh, uh, the only revolution. Okay. Uh, I have abridged it to reduce the time. Okay. I'll just read out. Okay. If you don't mind, I, uh, uh, Krishnaji tells the person, there's only one person who is interacting with him. Okay. Um, Krishnaji says, see what actually is without responding to it, with pleasure or with pain. Freedom is seeing. Seeing is freedom. You can see only in freedom. And the person, the participant says, this seeing may be an act of freedom, but what effect does it have on my bondage, which is the what is. Okay which is the thing seen. I see my mother-in-law bullying me. Okay. Uh, does she stop it because I see it? Okay. That's a genuine question. A person who has, you know, probably been experiencing this problem time and again. Okay. And Krishnaji's answer is very insightful. Krishnaji, see the action in your mother-in-law and see your responses without the further responses of pleasure and pain. Okay. See it in freedom. Your action may then be to ignore what she says completely or to walk out. Okay. But the walking out or the disregarding her is not a resistance. This choiceless awareness is freedom. The action from that freedom cannot be predicted systematized or put into the framework of social morality. Okay. I, I, I believe that Krishnaji is saying something that kind of that pausing in that, you are in that space, you registered those words or the actions the other person has, uh, you know, uh, exhibited. And in that state, if one is uh, free from the past emotions and so on, then it might be possible to come up to have an insight into the action that should emerge from it. And that in action may not solve the actual problem of, as Krishna you pointed out, the mother-in-law. Mother-in-law may continue to do whatever she wanted to do. Okay. It, it is not in the hands of uh, the individual, but the there is a different state of mind that responds to okay those actions of the other person okay there is a kind of a peace okay there is no that mulling over okay and trying to find something okay how to fight it out and so on uh, but there is a complete freedom and peace i think krishna ji is speaking about it and then the next question is that i have and um Yes, yes, this this insight might clear up okay some of the debris that collects over a period of time in our minds, okay, that clutter and so on. But over a period of time it will collect again. So therefore, should this insight continue to happen, okay, multiple times, time and again, every time an insight takes place and therefore your action follows? Or is there one insight? Okay, that wipes away all the debris. Okay, 
So the brain never goes back. It always stays in that zone. Right? So when Krishna Ji, in one of the conversations, this is with David Bohm and others, Krishna Ji said, yes, there is, there is such insight. Okay. And that insight is once and for all. That's what he has said. Okay. Once that happens, that insight, and which he said is instantaneous, then there is no kind of a falling back. Okay. It's my phrase, falling back and so on. And so the, uh, when the question was put to him, okay, uh, that what is it that why does that insight, uh, why doesn't that insight occur? Okay. To, in all of us. Now, um, it's only is Krishnamurti a freak, a biological freak, okay, that, you know, it happened to him, right? It's a random event and uh, it's a rare event. It doesn't happen. Others, Krishna denied that one. He said that that is not the important thing, okay, to ask ourselves, okay, uh, what is it that causes, okay, what can bring forth that insight? Uh, his response is uh, interesting, is also challenging. Okay. He said that we don't demand from ourselves. Okay. A demand not as a demand of, uh, you know, I want it by tomorrow kind of a demand or a, a very strong desire and so on. But he said that why doesn't it occur? That is challenging ourselves okay, without putting the pressure. Why doesn't it happen to me? Okay, why don't I demand excellence? Okay, that's the word that he used. Uh, why, why, don't, why don't we demand that one? That excellence is not in one particular thing. We demand excellence in one thing okay, or the other. An artist would demand excellence in painting. And, you know, he wants to take it to the highest level. Uh, somebody else, maybe a technologist, a scientist, who would like to take it to, you know, in his domain. But we don't ask for excellence for its own sake, just excellence in everything, okay? Not in one particular thing, but that's, that, uh, what should I, that spirit of, you know, uh, when there is that demand, he says that it is possible to have that insight, the deep insight, which will wipe away all the things. But I must confess, I have no clue to it, okay? That is, I don't know what it means to demand without uh, becoming neurotic, okay? What happens is for us, always the demand somehow goes uh, with the desire, okay? Wanting that one. I want excellence in everything. It becomes a more greed, wanting to possess that one, like that man, like Krishnaji, okay? Uh, so I, I I don't know I cannot really um, speak about it. Okay, this is, I I can only just say that Krishna has spoken that there is a need for that the deep demand from oneself. That means you I need to completely gather all my energy um, into you know and see that this is the most important thing in life and so on. Perhaps that is what he is hinting at. And I think I would uh, stop here. It is now uh, 45, okay? And uh, I'll pause here. And I was told that uh, Dr. Gajanan Rao and uh, Harsh would uh, speak for some time. I hope I have communicated, I have shared something that I have, what I felt in my own life, okay? Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. So it was really a very stimulating discourse. We are grateful, really grateful for this. Uh, I would now request Dr. Gajanan Rao to uh, share his observation for the next 10, 15 minutes and followed by that, followed by that, uh, Harsh Ji would perhaps like to say something. So Dr. Gajanan Rao, sir. Sir, unmute yourself. Unmute. Mm. 
जैन साहब हाँ सर आई हैव टू रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर राव प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ या या ओके ओके मैं हेल्प ना या या यस यस वेल आफ्टर लिसनिंग टू पर्सन लाइक डॉक्टर कुमार स्वामी को मैं फर्स्ट मेट in vasanta vihar he was making enquiries how do i meet this man how do i come to rishi valley having finished his phd the same the same except the greatness of the mustache kumar swami nothing in him has changed but lot has changed this is another matter he could teach he could organize he was so fervently listening to krishnamurti and the humility with which she came on the subject is something i have to learn because as he said if you listen to some words and you listen again and again there comes a feeling you have captured the essential of it essence of it there's a feeling that you know dangerous feeling and you may even talk to others about it before even you finish you know and there is also as he said the enormous Hurry to do something, learn something, and show it to others that you have done, which is not necessary at all. He really was talking about attention, observation, as Shrimati would want it, and as not a matter of just curiosity. And when he said about even the demand, can it be only demand? I said, yes, sir. These are words to be watched in us. In our vocabulary, they become very common, and we use them, emphatically underline them. And the people to whom you are talking to may think, "Oh, yeah, this is a great man; he knows it." So I, today, I really learned something from him. Just to keep the whole talk to what you think you really know, and you may say, "Krishna Murthy said that is nothing wrong." This is what he might have. Uh, men it's also not new in some of the group meetings we see this assertions and then uh, the certain pseudo authenticity brought into the thing like that i think we have to learn all of us who run centers must learn this because as he himself said he might have been a freak but he always said no not everybody must be told must always i descend to switch on an electric lamp Once it is, and it is in a way so, because when we were experimenting with rats in India, in Hyderabad somewhere, teaching it a certain way to go safely to a destination, we giving shocks on the way. The same set of uh, experiments were more easily carried out in Australia by this rats, different kind of rats there, and as if there was a consciousness of rat, rat consciousness has it, and then. Delivers them more intelligent. If you, the, if the Russia has put a Sputnik in the space, so many countries later on put more sophisticated Sputniks. The mind is that. So that's why the mind is one. It joined the whole lot of mind. I think it's the larger mind or consciousness. Is it called? Um, amazing. Certain things came to mind as we talked. Uh, the one thing he just stressed about, I would like. To I really stress again because I had, I had I had misunderstood the word stay. Stay with the problem. Stay with the question was very often the insistence of K as he talked, gave his talks and conversation. Stay with it. The staying with has a lot of relevance when you're actively with it, seeing, experiencing, and all that. Only thing is, it sometimes even irritates you when he says. It's your own soul or a problem. Hold it in the hand. You may be going through a very bad problem affecting you physically, mentally. So hold it in the hand and look at it as if you are looking at a marvelous sugar. <laughs> well, it at least shows you it can be done. Honestly, it may not boastful. We are man of eighty-five now. One do lots of problems, right? From younger days, and even not very well to do in schooling, college, and then going to work at 
19 years to 24 for a very uh, small sum. Not something, but it never looked so terrible those days. And after a little Krishna Ji, there's even a little uh, feeling of nicety about it, all that you did. And uh, I also feel that Krishna Ji will rightly, he said, go to the source when you want to begin meetings. Listen to him for some time. And there may be three or four questions you pick out of that and then discuss it. This is also all right what uh, our Sushil Ji is doing in a way. He is only calling people who have been for quite some time actively at Krishnamurti. And they are not asserting anything. You are not to get anything out of us and think that is the right thing because he knows. My brother used to say, when I understand you better more than when I read Krishnamurti, he gave me a shock. <laughs> am, I, am I doing a notes for him or something to make it simplified? Well, but he always said that too, as I said uh, sometime earlier. Sir, it's not so complicated. You miss the whole thing because it is so simple and subtle. Well, that's also a hint. Maybe we are thinking we are um, a kind of a huge windmill like the this thing, um, what and windmill. Uh, uh, we, we may think what we are dealing with is impossible task, but they may not be. So we learn to say, maybe it's possible. And then go on, not, not with that kind of a rugger which brings in all the uh, speed in you and, and uh, made with failure, but that kind of planning in a way, steadily, steadfast, put all your strength in it, mind to it. So maybe we don't know, not a question. that's not a question of time. That preparation is not time. Because you're all the time at it. So it, anything shouldn't become stale if you're listening, if you're attending. We talked a lot about attention. And when you dedicate, if there is true feel in you a sense of urgency, you have enough curiosity in you to know the whole thing. You don't give it up or it doesn't look so big a thing. You know the structure, the function, the whole anatomy, the geology of something. You are very familiar. You are very near it. So what I'm trying to say is nothing is impossible, but some things are maybe. We are not to make it so easy and then let others know, yes, it's possible. I won't prolong it because I know last time it went too, a bit too long and I was not too happy about it. I want to say, look at the learning Dr. Kumar Sami showed you, how one learns and how it becomes part of you when the learning has been sound, which means you were with it completely. It became part of you and that kind of a learning stays. And not that you have to begin all over again from ABC. There are people who don't attend. It's a different thing. You know, there's a story about a man who was in a beautiful island for 50 years or more. And he thought he should retire and go back to his own place. And when he went back, people asked him, do you know you were one of the most beautiful islands in the uh, world? How did you feel it when we were in such a oasis? He said, very dull way, oh, I see, was it very beautiful? Nobody told me there, otherwise I would have seen things there. I missed totally. So this is the way. And then he reminded you about the habits that easily form in us. And habits again are not habits when you're consciously doing it. And there is also a bit of learning right from the morning, getting up after bread, the way you look at the window, come out of the room, meet your own people, you smile, and then go off to your morning chores, and then dress up for office or whatever. Um, everything, you, the way you select your clothes, look at the weather, 
look at some dirt as it said somewhere on the wall, which I ignore to see sometime, anytime. And when it's when it wiped, also you won't see sometimes it's gone. So attention, not concentration, a certain amount of awareness that a sort of a uh, gives color to attention. And he always said, don't bother, you didn't attend in some places. Because in nature of man, there is also fatigue, there is also inattention, you go off a bit. There are people put a hand on the head and say, oh my God, see what I did, I have not attended. It does not always come back. Watch inattention, your attention. That's an easy formula, so to say. So make life easy. Maybe odds, maybe nice things happen. Float, not sink. This is what, this is what Krishna Ji really taught me. And uh, I may be sincerely saying this. I went to him because there seem to be problems and sometimes I don't deal with it properly and uh, I get into a kind of depression. There's a bit of fear. I think supposing I, I suppose I went to him and I was, I don't know what, age 19, 17. I was 26. I think 70, how old was I? 36, I suppose. And then on, he was so impressed by whatever he said. Not that I'm saying I worship him, so I take his every word. There is a lot of sense in what he says. Again, depends on how much you take from it. Like you say, you got a small vessel, it is all you take from the teaching home. You are come with eagerness to take quite some of what he's saying. You take a lot home, then you say. And there is a within, there is a without, influencing both. And with all of what he says, everything should be possible to be noticed properly, felt properly, treated properly, and they can become part of it. I won't say anything more. I'm only saying that Dr. Kumar Sami made learning somewhat more easy today. And he felt one could learn soundly from a man like Krishnamurti. And when does a man come that way again? We don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Thank you so much. Uh, may I request Sarji now to uh, give some observation on this? Yeah, please. And then, sir, Harshad Parikh, sir. After Harshad Tanka, sir, Harshad Parikh, sir, for five minutes. Yeah, so let Harshad say something, then we can go to Harshad. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that is what I am saying. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, well. So we lost you. We can't hear you now. We can't hear you. Oh, it was a very interesting talk. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, very clearly put, and you, and easy to follow. And. Uh, if I can add some observations, because I, firstly, I would say that, yes, I, what you said is very much how I see things, but maybe I can add, uh, build upon some of the things that you said. So I think one of the things that you pointed to was diligence in attention, that somehow we have to be alert and aware of what is going on. And uh, the question is, uh, so to see that, I think we need to look at memory and this whole process of recording and registration again. And now the memory, they say, is essentially three parts to it. One is recording. You see something, you observe something, you record it, the brain. Then you retain it. It stays for some time, and then later on, you recall it. So that is... And generally, 
we are recording things all the time, even if we know it or not. I think you mentioned that. Uh, it's kind of automatic. And the retention also is pretty much automatic, except that if the it can decay, you can lose some things over a period of time, but not that much, unless there are problems uh, with the functioning of the brain. But mostly that's how it happens. So it's the recall part that is the interesting part. And there, the problem often is that at first, when you're, you're very young, there is not much that in the brain already when you see something. So you just take it in and you record it and nothing much happens. But as you go on, you begin to relate what you just observed, what has just been recorded with what has already been recorded. And that comes up, that gets recalled. And that connecting what you are just seeing to the past is what I understand by the process of registration. So that is how you register hurt, that you see something and that it relates to some event in the past that was unpleasant or some thought that is unpleasant and then you're hurt by the person who is in front of you. So that is, that is the point at which that occurs. And of course, the more that is coming up all the time in response to what we see, uh, the more difficult it is uh, to keep, it distracts one. That's where the distraction comes from. It distracts one, it takes our attention away. Maybe it's pleasant things you remember or bad things or just our mind shifts sideways and starts thinking of what had happened in a similar situation before. So that, and that is actually the process of inattention. That is when our attention wanders and does not stay with whatever is actually going on in the present. So now I, my suggestion is that this diligence in attention is actually, and I think Krishnaji also says something like that. This is where I, that really we, it is inattention that we have to give, to observe. We have to, we can't try deliberate, deliberately to say, I'm going to be attentive. I'm going to have my total focus on this. Because even that is a thought and that is also confusing. It may bring about a certain kind of focus and a certain concentration on something. But that, Krishnaji was fairly clear, was not the kind of attention that he was talking about as is necessary. So if we are inattentive and our attention is wandering to all these related things, then uh, that is what is, that is what is actually happening. And therefore, what, when he says that you have to observe what is, it is the process of inattention that he is. Uh, explicitly sometimes he refers to it as watching watching the process of inattention is attention. So uh, I think that is, that is a, a crucial thing that it's not quite a, a deliberate focus on attention, but this awareness of the process of inattention. And the, I, I think you also talked about that gap, observing that gap. So that, that gap, I think, exists at the point when whatever you are seeing, observing and recording sparks off the reactions and the connections in, in the memory. And that is what is, but there is a gap before that comes in. And you know, it's in Krishnaji sometimes it's called the silence. It's like the silence between two notes. And he says the music is actually the focus on the silence between the notes. That's where music lives. It's not a question of knowing all the notes. Uh, and I am reminded of a, an old song that I used to know, which goes something like this. Uh, 
you know all the words and you sing all the notes but you never quite learned the song he sang so i think this is this is quite relevant in we listen to what krishna ji has said we even understand the words uh, we remember them we can even predict what uh, maybe we can sing along as well but the song is something more subtle and the song is that he is singing is lies beyond the words lies uh, so if we look for it in the words it's not going to be there it's going to be the subtlety is in the attention that is so acute that you begin to see the functioning of thought and the gap in the before the reaction and the space between the thoughts that is so that is now another interesting thing that uh, kumar swami ji said is about this insight if i can refer to it in a kind of a uh, lighthearted way the final insight uh, the final insight and he says there is such a thing as the final insight uh, and uh, but he also says something <clears throat> else he says that to have the quality of attention that is capable of seeing the action of the entirety to the self you already have to be on the other side and that's how he refers to it it's not that you are going to build up to a point where eventually bit by bit you will understand bits of yourself and then one day you will find yourself beyond the self or something like that it's more that if you are observing if the self is observing then it's not going to be it's going to be colored by everything that the self is and you're not going to see the truth for what it is so you already have to be somehow detached from the self and able to observe so the, it's the beginning which is and sometimes he also says the first step is the last step so i think that's that's quite an important thing to recognize and also to recognize that saying something like uh, i do not have this insight or i do have this insight or somebody has this insight every time i anyone says anything like that it's a statement about the self and the self is never going to have that insight it's never going to be the self that has the insight there is only insight here. and that insight is beyond the self and that so we are even asking ourselves the question do i have this have i got it have i not got it am i failing am i succeeding all of those are distractions all of those are uh, i think what we are left with when we observe that we are distracted is as krishna ji has suggested that that is what is that is how we are and that is what we observe the distraction and not anchor after this total attention or final insight but continue in our daily life which is what the subject of this to be observing and learning the process of the self the process of inattention and maybe the subtlety that rajanand ji talks about will come to us well, thank you that's all i say you know. thank you ji thanks a lot uh harshad bhai you want to say something please unmute yourself yeah <clears throat> we can't hear you we can't hear you <clears throat> i 
I would like to add something later after Harshad ji has spoken, just for a couple of minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, perfectly all right. I think we are not able to hear Harshad ji. So mm -hmm. maybe Harshad ji, you can, you can go ahead and say something. Yeah, we'll, we'll try Harshad ji later. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, I lost my train of thought at that point. Yeah. So please continue. It will come back at some point. Yeah. Asha, do you want to you want to try one again once again? No, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Some problem with the audio. <clears throat> yes, I can say something now. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah. See. Another question is about the urgency and why we don't feel this urgency right at the beginning. I think uh, Kumar Swamiji said, do we have this energy to have this attention all the time or uh, that is why we don't perhaps uh, pay attention and our mind switches off because we and don't have the energy to keep up this attention. And I'm reminded of something that Krishiji said, which is, which I found very important in my life, is that, you know, if you're concerned with the quality of your own uh, attention, your own, maybe even a change of your consciousness, which is natural because after all, when we are studying the self, it's oneself that we are most, it ha have most access to. And we can study the action of the self in ourselves. But if our concern is with just ourselves, he said that that is still a little thing. It is still self-centered. If you're asking whether we can achieve something or we can have this quality of attention or insight, that's still essentially self-centered. And his concern was with the transformation of the consciousness of mankind. And he says, if you are concerned only with your own transformation of self, then you will not have the energy because it's still essentially self limited. But if your concern is with the transformation of the consciousness of mankind, because you see the necessity and the urgency of that, then perhaps you will change. So the focus he re really put on was this concern. And I never tire of saying this because everything that he did himself, come even starting the schools, wanting to talk with young minds, all of that comes from his concern with the transformation of the consciousness of mankind. And he reminds us that if there is anything that he would want us to carry on, it is that concern. Thank you, Arjit. Thanks. Arshad, why can you can you make one more effort? Otherwise, we go back to questions now. No, we can't hear you. I think there is some problem with the audio. So, uh, can we can, can we I, start? Uh, Dubeji, sorry. Yes, can sir. I say a few words, Dubeji? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yes, I think uh, you see the reason why I started. Uh, uh, with myself or with myself within quotes, is that that's where we are. Okay. While I can see that Krishnaji was, um, you know, has had a different consciousness or uh, it's a global consciousness and he talked about it, uh, but I cannot just make it into an abstraction and say that, you know, I'm concerned about the whole world. 
I need to begin. I, I understand that there is a conflict in the world between people. At an intellectual level, I see it very quite clearly, right? In my neighborhood, I see that the, my own lifestyle has certain implications to, you know, the uh, larger set of people. However, I need to begin somewhere I am, okay? And I need to begin with my, the, the state that I am in. I need to begin with my inattention, right? And if I say that I need to observe uh, closely my inattention, then I get into again a vicious cycle because I'm inattentive. So how do I bring attention to inattention? Okay, so I just wanted to avoid the circularity of it. Okay, and to begin at a very small beginning. In fact, Krishnaji at one point he said that it's like a funnel. One end is narrow, but it widens. Okay, uh, the, the, the tail end is rather narrow, but you may begin there. Okay, but then it expands itself. Once you begin to understand you see the connections, okay? You see how your own lifestyle, how your own aspirations, which is a self-centered activity, is affecting the whole, okay? The relationships, right? And so on. I think it is a journey. It's a, a, a point where you begin. The point where you begin is where you are, okay? I can't begin at the global consciousness level. Then I become an activist. I, I'll start, uh, you know, an organization, an NGO to fight uh, injustices and so on. So I, I would be, but having that, having listened to this man who spoke about the global consciousness and having seen him, okay, and his concerns, the way tirelessly he went around the world, and it is there as a backdrop, okay. But for me, to begin there is going to be an impossible thing to begin on the other shore, okay? I'm here and I have to work at it, okay? And I feel it is not a self-centered activity. It is to see the self-centered activity in action. And then you kind of, you know, wipe it away. Okay? That's how I, I have looked at it, yes. No, I would agree with you completely. You have to begin with yourself. There is nowhere else to begin. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. right. But in fact, the fact that we are now sharing this yeah. is part of the way that we affect the consciousness yes. of the world. Yeah. So whatever we are engaged in, whatever inquiry and learning we are engaged in, by sharing it with the rest of the world, by even a group like this, we are relating to the... So that is why it is important to do these things. And in doing these things, by also uh, saying to each other what we see, what we are learning, what we are experiencing, uh, we are aiding our own understanding as well, you know, exactly. as, as everybody else is. It's not because I may not be getting something or I may have got something wrong. And by putting it to somebody else, they can, they can say something to me. I can say something to them or expand it or, or whatever, you know. I think this is a process of inquiry, which was very important, which was very important. Yeah. And you see, about this, uh, uh, the, the large insight, the insight, yes. mother of all insights. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it is, I think, you see, in the conversation that uh, Krishnaji had, he went along with these little insights. And then yeah. he said, suddenly the next meeting, the next day meeting, he said, you see, sirs, I never went through this. Yes. <laughs> okay. I didn't I never, <laughs> there was one day, there was this dialogue where yeah. they talked yeah. about these insights, looking into things yeah. and observing and, you know, inattention. All that. Yeah. And yeah. the next day, another meeting, he began yeah. by saying, he never went through any of that okay. himself. Okay. So it is, uh, that's what I think Harsh is referring to that mm -hmm. uh, he was on the other shore. You know? Other shore. Other shore. We don't know how he was there on the other shore, but 
he was on the other show. So I, I probably have heard that, uh, being on the other show. Is it that um, you can get to the other show to even begin? Is that a possibility? Maybe, How does one get? Hmm? I think some, you see, at some point, Krishna himself had said there is no, no yes. other show, really. It is, there is one, there's okay. nothing, it's a metaphor more than yeah. uh, this one. The other point that I wanted to tell you is that uh, Krishna also said at some point, don't be greedy. If you have been attentive at some point in time, don't ask for 24 hour attention. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. So it, it will naturally probably explode. Yes. But your attention, if you are worried that you have to be, you know, finished with the whole attention, 24 hour attention. So yes. again, again, we are back to the old game. Old game. But then, why did you say uh, uh, whether? Uh, is it possible to get back to attention when you're lost a bit? You know you're inattention, and you know there is inattention, you're in attention. He often said that. I also thought it was something relevant. Did you say it's impossible to get to attention again? No. Did you say no. it was impossible to get to be attentive again? No. no. The very fact of yes. recognizing that there was the attention is gone is attention. Gone. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. that sometimes takes time. Sometimes you immediately know you're off. Yeah. 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 Thank you, sir. I think we can take a few questions if people have any. Yes. I asked uh, one question to Mr. Kumar Swami. I would like to. Yes, Mr. Verma, please yes. ask. I want to learn Mr. Kumar Swami. Basic thing Kumar? From Dr. I want to learn a basic thing from Dr. Kumar Swami. He being a, a physics man, uh, um, what is the relationship between consciousness and matter and how they communicate with each other? Because I'm not talking about what started first, whether it was consciousness or matter. I'm not going into that debate, but how do we, how do we communicate with life as such, with people, with living and non-living also, with trees, plants, and even say rock. The, my personal experience is when you see a rock, something happens to consciousness. Is it a communication between consciousness to consciousness having no role of matter in that because each thing may be having uh, a consciousness because otherwise global consciousness, the idea of global consciousness cannot be there because this world is made up of matter as well as through consciousness, you know, whatever little we know. So the, what relationship is there about this? So if you are asking me as a you know person who had done some science and there is no clue really currently to what consciousness is. So one cannot speak scientifically what the relationship is the, between matter and consciousness because scientifically there is no uh, there is no way that people have found to bring consciousness into description. Okay. Okay. So there is no such thing. So I, I am not able to speak about it. And for me, it is also not very important. Okay. But that, what about transcendence? You see, unless until the man, the observer, he transcends, he transcends, and there is co-presence of something, he will not get anything out of it, whether it is self-referentiality or is it self-referentiality or something is there in that which comes to my mind. See, That's why it is important in everyday life also. I think if we try to put these things into words, we get into some difficulty because yes. um, we have a subjective feeling yes. okay, of having experienced things, having uh, seen something. Okay. Yes. And there is a state of mind which become accessible to the individual. Okay. Yes. Uh, but 
there is no way that you can describe them as of now mm -hmm. in a scientific language. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that part is completely almost out. Okay. okay. And I think what is important is to see, uh, you know, that this subjective experience uh, of pleasure, pain, and various variety of things, okay, um, we invest too much in all of that. Okay. Our life is completely driven by it. Okay. Now, is it possible to understand it? To understand and go beyond these positivities and negativities that we are swept through in the course of a lifetime. Okay. So my concern personally has been to see it is just like observing the water flow by, okay, and not get into the swimming, okay, and get drowned in it. Okay, these emotions, these all that, is it possible to okay to get a to understand deeply all that that is happening. Okay. It's not just in me, but in the world in such, because yes. all of us go through those kinds of, uh, you know, feelings, emotions, and so on. Uh, is it possible to understand them in some way? Not individually, but the source of it all. Okay. That understanding is not a scientific understanding. Okay. <laughs> It's not a scientific understanding. It's an understanding which, uh, uh, which it is like wiping a glass, you know, window, clear, <laughs> so that you see things well. Because uh, it's a physics, is, physics especially, you get so many things, material through thought experiments. Most of the things started with thought experiments, right? And from there, it is translated somehow to something practical. So thought that way is important also. This is what I feel. No, the all scientific in inquiry is thought. It's not just yeah. the thought experiment. The entire mathematical world and so on, everything is, uh, you know, thought. It is not beyond thought and so on. It's a part of the thinking process. Thank you, Dr. Kumar Swami. Thank you very much. Can I have a question to Mr. Kumar Swami? Yes, please. Uh, my question to you, Mr. Kumar Swami, is why do you give so much significance to fragmentation or no fragmentation? Why do we give so significance to, uh, say, energy depletion or no depletion? As you said, a small boy doesn't have such problems. No, because as uh, Harsh pointed out, the, the small boys don't have memory registration yet. But as they get older, beyond three years, they begin to record. And the recording is the one that creates the problem. That you have images and you invest emotions into images. Okay. And the energy that is needed to look at gets fragmented in various ways. Okay. Through inattention and so on. There is a need for gathering that energy. It is not going to come from other sources. Okay. I think, I believe that we do have that energy, but only it is dissipated in different things. So is it possible to gather that energy? And that's what we call as attention. Okay. Once that energy is there, then you attend to it. It is in some sense, it's a physical energy. Physical means it is, you can call it physical or mental energy, right? But as we can see that we are often distracted okay, by a variety of things. We distract ourselves. There is a lot of wandering of the mind. Now, is it possible to gather that energy? That's it. That is the thing. Without that, there is no possibility of an attention. Even the very fact that I am inattentive is a kind of gathering some energy. That, that registering the fact that I am not attending to things. Okay? That recognition itself brings a certain energy into this one. That's the beginning. Otherwise, you don't even observe your inattention. Okay. Somewhere you find suddenly it clicks that you are fragmented. Okay. Now, that recognition is the starting point. Otherwise, you will be in inattention only. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. We can have one more question. Anybody having anything? Sir, yeah, I want to say something. Yes. Whether yes. one can be said aware just by putting deep attention on observables or one is aware when his attention is on the consciousness. Or in other mean, I can say okay, whether energy is consumed for become aware or you find an ocean of energy with awareness. They go, I, I think they go together. That is you, at some point when you recognize that you are inattentive, that is an attention, okay? That, that recognition itself, it brings in some energy. Okay? And each, each of us has energy, okay? It is not that we, we are, don't have energy, it's just that it's fragmented. So, uh, the starting point is to recognize, okay, somehow, okay, we don't know how it happens, I cannot say that. We, we recognize sometimes, I am, in my life, I am fragmented, okay, I am, uh, you know, distracted by too many things, okay, and uh, let me declutter my life, okay. That is the beginning, that itself brings some energy, the very fact that I Take it seriously, my own observation that there is cluttering, I'm, uh, my energy is being dissipated in various ways. That is the starting point and that itself gives the energy. It may not give the entire the ocean of energy and so on, but it just gives us the energy to look at the inattention. As Harshji pointed out, okay, you need to look at that one in inattention. That, I think it is, it is not just a linear process, you know, you do this first, you do that, and so on. Each one uh, builds on the other, okay? They go together. That the more you look at the inattention, you find that you have greater energy, okay? You suddenly realize there is this nonsense here that's going on, you put it aside, okay? And that happens in a very natural way. One and more thing, you, Dove, sir, you have to announce the next Sunday lecture without subject. Okay, okay. Because thank, you, Dr. Thank, thank you, Dr. Kumar Swami, for being with us. We are indeed very thankful. Uh, next Wednesday, we will be hearing Mr. K. Krishnamurti from Vasant Bihar. He will be talking to us. Uh, so, I'll again request uh, Harshji and Dr. Gajanan Rao to be there because he would like to have a dialogue kind of session rather than a long speech. So with these words, I thank you all once again. Thank you so much for being a part of this dialogue session. Thank you. Dubeji, you must talk too. Yes, sir, sir I already you. did twice before I invited you all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks sir, for the... Sir, Vijay, sir, Vijay Chabla, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank Parit, you. sir. Umesh Saklani, sir, are also requested to come in the next Sunday lecture, particularly Asad Parik sir, with clear audio. That is what I <laughs> demand from him. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dubey sir. Thank you. I Thank don't you. have what to praise you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank you, Kumar Swami. May, may, I request, may I request Kumar Swami, sir, to attend next lecture of KK Krasamurthy? Could you please I'll try. Sir. I'll try. I'll just look up. I have some classes to take also. I'll try. Yeah, yeah. If you come even after 11.30 or 11.45, yeah. that is I'll also just... welcome. Okay. Thank you. Because, Thank you. Because you have requested a dialogue type talk only. Yes. And he has not given yet subject. So it will be my pleasure and privilege to have you there. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.